take it. Yeah, we'll just manage without. That'll just be the easiest thing. Okay. There. There. I've still got that window. Does ever anybody else see that square yes. window? Yes. Yeah. I don't Sorry. know what to do. It's very frustrating. <laughs> I, I will do what you tell me to. Just go ahead and uh, share the screen from here, and we will all do our best to okay, ignore it. I'm screen, and, I am currently uh, screen sharing. So, well, it's not in. Um, I still see the thumbnails on the side. Do you still see those? Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Yeah. And then we still don't see the laser pointer option. Mm -hmm. No, it didn't give sheet. Uh, looked at doing that. Okay. okay. Well, we'll make do. We'll manage. Lemonade out of lemons. That's what we're doing. You might want to um, get this to where you're not seeing parts of me. Where is the thing? Yeah. 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 Okay, and I can go to gallery. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to get somebody in IT to figure this out. We cannot figure it out. I mean, which yeah. means Gina's gonna have to come to the office and try to figure it out, and then train everybody else. Okay, because Gina is IT. <laughs> you can't get it. I can't do it remotely. I'm sorry. Gina's other name is IT. It is. <laughs> somebody from IT. She's worked on it, and we can't. Well, I've just worked on it remotely, like researching it and sending you that thing, but I haven't been in the office to see uh, what's going on with that computer. I didn't look at that the other day. So weird. It's 9.55 and we're already live on Facebook, so I'm just going to throw out a word of caution. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That would be most advisable. Oh, I'm nothing if not efficient, Gina. I'm saying it for myself as much as for anybody else. <laughs> yeah, I am. This has been enjoyable. I've enjoyed it. That's why I thought, since I did this, I thought that's why I volunteered to do a monitor the next fall. Well, yeah, because you've had the experience as an instructor. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I can do Gina's job, but if I can you know, tell when people raise their hands and things. So. Hey, Gina, I'm saying this in front of Sandra, but since I don't have audio on the office computer, can you do the, um, this is her last class, and we thank, your, thank her very much? Yes, I can do the live quest. Uh, spiel. Spiel. I have spiel. At the very end, of the last slide says okay. thank you. So. Okay. Well, I I normally do do that, and mm. I do thank you, Sandra. Oh, I've enjoyed it. It it you know it's been nice to get out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> so. There's only one problem, Sandra. What's that? You always look so good, and I'm oh gosh, my I'm... yucky stuff. <laughs> well, that's nice to hear. Up. Thank you. So, because um, tomorrow's my birthday, so this is my last day of this year. So. <laughs> I went down to a friend's lake house yesterday, and I was just going to go for lunch. And she said, "You know, just stay the night. And just eat this on the lake." Hamilton's. So I got up early this morning and drove back to Little Rock. So. Well, happy birthday. Well, it's tomorrow, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah, COVID so, birthday, it's a little different than. So 29 again, huh? Well, yeah. 20. I think I told the bishop one time, for some reason, the bishop was there the weekend I went up for the birthday blessing. And he said, How old you are? And I said, 21 plus, because I am. <laughs> John, can you see that box at the top? You know, that please move this window away. Can you see yes. that? Okay. Yeah. We, we can't figure out how to get rid of it. So y'all just live over it. By just touching the screen or touching it. There it is. It's fading. There. So she just has to keep moving her mouse while she's talking? Yeah, probably if she touched some, it's probably some magic secret that if you touch the screen, like it just went away. And it's coming back. It's a layer. We'll do. Thank you, Leah. Oh, it says please move. Yeah. 
please move this window away. So grab it and drag it over. I think it's talking about the layer of the PowerPoint and it's trying to say that Zoom is behind it or some other application is behind mm -hmm. it. And it's something it, about layering. It's, it's, yeah. it's a layer. Yeah, well. Yeah. We'll just I, make I celebrated the 49th anniversary of my 29th birthday. That's well. Yeah, we something like that. I, I'll be 61 tomorrow. I'll tell you all. I mean, it's just a fact. Oh, you guys are babies. Well, thank you. I came home last Thursday from class and my husband hung my painting up that he got me for my birthday. So I've had my. Nice. I've had my birthday present for a week now, and I love it. Well, I've had it longer than that, but it was just sitting propped up against the wall, and I, he traded out the painting that we had there. Print, actually, it's a print. But, so. I'm going to miss coming up here and seeing y'all and teaching class, but I volunteered to be a class monitor for fall, so... Yeah, and we'll talk about that and what time works best for you and stuff. Yeah, we'll try it out. We got a couple weeks there. And it'll take me that long to make all the puzzle pieces to go together. <laughs> <laughs> it's 10 o'clock, so um, I'm going to thank Sandra for coming again for week four of Techniques and Art. And um, it's been a very good class. We've had a lot of attendance. We've got these recorded and on our website, they will stay there for at least three years until we look at the website and go, you know, maybe we need to revamp this <laughs> and then we'll put it off for another five years. And so don't worry, it'll, it'll be there for a while. Um, we appreciate Sandra coming to the office to do this and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Sandra and let her start. Well, it's been my pleasure, Gina. You guys are so lovely to work with. And, uh, that, you know, I love my cats, but I don't have them walking across my keyboard if I come into the office. So, so techniques and art. As usual, we'll take a look at a couple things that came up last time. Here's the plate on the left and then the print that was made on the right. And what I'm trying to show you here is how the plate is the reversed image. So when the artist was drawing this woman's face, she he put her profile facing to the right because he wanted it to appear on the paper as turning to the left. I think that is, it makes my brain hurt to think about having to do that. Um, and probably it is an acquired skill. Um, you get better at it the more you do it. But we had a couple of questions. We had one about jelly printing from Bernadette, who I found out knows probably far more than I do. It's a form of art called mono printing. It creates a single image. Remember we talked about the monotype and how they print the image and then they break the printing plate. Well, here the printing plate is a gel uh, press. And so you use the jelly plate. It's a soft silicone plate and you create a monotype and you don't have to break the print, uh, the plate. It's a very affordable option. I got this image off of Amazon. You can buy the kit and it, it teaches you to do it. Obviously, the more talent you have, the more practice you get with it, the better your technique would be. Um, like I said, it's readily available. If you wanna start printmaking this afternoon, I bet Amazon can have it to you by Saturday. <laughs> or Barnes and Noble or any number of places. It's, like I said, it's very accessible for people who want to get started, get their feet wet in um, jelly printing. And you can continue to go on and become very talented. You know, um, my art friend said anyone, it's accessible to a starting person, but very experienced printmakers can also use it. And now we're gonna talk about, cause at first, when I went home, I thought this is what she was talking about, the Jeshe print, which is a reproduction on canvas of paper, and they use an inkjet printer, and it's a more expensive to produce than traditional lithographic print techniques, but you get richer colors, you get bigger 
um, you can get bigger canvases or prints. You see here on a professional printer, um, print these works. Um, I've seen them a lot lately in for sale and in auctions, and I wasn't sure exactly what it was. So we all learned something today. But today our technique is sculpture. And um, Michelangelo said it best. I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. And um, this photograph is a partially completed figure by Michelangelo. You can see the marks of his chisel as he carved away at it. And um, I find those, when you see those on a sculpture, yes, it's unfinished because they would have, they're, he, it would have been polished and uh, refined and smoothed as a finished work of art, but I find them very thrilling because it's the actual hand of Michelangelo. You're, you're seeing the impression it made. So sculpture, it is a third dimension. Up to now, we have been talking about two dimensional height and width. Now we're gonna talk about depth. And sculpture has one of the longest histories in art. You know, um, figures made in the cave. We don't look at those mainly because the, the uh, paintings are magnificent and they've survived longer. It's those of just because of their placement and uh, probably sculptures were small and carried with them. New materials and techniques and concepts from the 20th century have kept sculpture as a very innovative art. It, it doesn't get old. Um, this is Louise Bourgeois' Maman, 1999, bronze and steel outside the Bilbao, Spain, Guggenheim. Um, a beautiful, beautiful piece. She was very intrigued by spiders since childhood. She saw them as very maternal images. Um, I'm not sure I would agree with that, but um, usually there's an egg sac, and I believe there is on this. And I like it that there's people in the picture because it gives you a sense of scale, how large this piece is. Um, so a lot of her works are outdoors. Now, here's an example from one of the temples on the Acropolis in Greece. And it's, I think, one of the loveliest things um, I've ever seen. It's Athena Nike adjusting her sandal strap, even though it's damaged by time and pollution and all sorts of things, you can still see the beauty of the drapery and how the carving of the drapery has revealed the body beneath the movement beneath. Relief sculpture is meant to be viewed only from one side. It has three-dimensional depth, but it does not occupy space. And this is a perfect example of a relief sculpture. You know, you do see depth. You can tell that one knee is closer to you the viewer than the other, her shoulders, different heights, um, but it is not independent, it's not freestanding, it doesn't occupy space independent. Bob relief or low relief is a subject projects very slightly from the background. This is a sarcophagus lid uh, from the Mayan cla late classical period. A common example of bas relief or low relief, both terms are um, acceptable. Bas is French and haute as in high relief uh, is a coin. Look, look at a dime, a quarter, a penny. There's a great example of a relief, low relief sculpture. Now high relief or high, um, it projects boldly by at least half their depth and parts of the figure should be unattached and in the round. You can see this on the foot of the horseman here. It casts a shadow. There is actually space behind that foot against the frieze there. This is the cavalry from the Ionic relief at the Parthenon. It is a breathtaking procession. Uh, it recreates the I think it was every four years they would redress the six foot statue of Athena in the Parthenon. And it was this massive parade. And 
you see it and it looks very static at first and then the horses begin to move a little faster. It is just breathtaking to see. Um, should you get to the Parthenon in Greece, be sure and take binoculars and have a look. And if you get to Nashville, go look at the uh, copy there at the Centennial Park. That Parthenon, they worked very hard to recreate uh, what the Parthenon, they, they study and, and change things slightly when new research comes out. And you get an idea of what the Parthenon looked like when it was brand new, pristine. Uh, there's even an Athena, a six foot, excuse me, the massive sculpture at the end in her hand to get an idea of size. The Athena holds her right hand out. Standing in it is a Nike sculpture, a winged victory sculpture. And that sculpture standing on her hand is six feet tall. I always used to get a student that was six feet tall to stand up to make that point, you know, that that the the sculpt the full sculpture of Athena was massive. Sadly, it was wood covered with ivory and gold, and well, things like that don't last sometimes very long. Okay, sculpture can be additive or subtractive processes. Modeling, and we'll talk about their specific definitions in a moment, and assembly are considered additive process. That is, you put things together to make the sculpture. Carving, this is easy to stand, is subtractive. You know, Michelangelo and his chisel are removing stone to free that angel, and that is a subtractive process. So there are four basic methods in sculpture, excuse me, modeling, which is uh, plastic materials that Play-Doh you played with as a child, Clay is very common, wax or plaster. Casting, it is um, both subtractive and additive, so it doesn't fit under either one of those headings. And you make a mold, you pour metal into it, and you make the bronze sculptures that we think of um, are these kind of casting. Carving, again, cutting and shaping the material. And assembly is pretty much a 20th century art form where you assemble different pieces to make a sculpture. And we'll see an excellent example of that in a moment. So here's modeling, late classical period Mayan. Um, you can see the paint that was originally on her. Um, and the nice thing about clay is it's soft and it can be very subtly, mo subtly modeled and use detail. You can see there's an expression on her face. The, um, and then after the figure was created, he went in with stone and clay tools and made the rings that are the bracelet on her wrist. Um, the jewelry was probably made separate and added. And then you um, usually heat, you usually cover these with a lacquer, a varnish, a resin and heat them and um, they become um, sculptures. Clay is very, very common in the world, and so it's often used for this purpose. But because of the mineral content in various geographic regions, um, we see difference in the colors in the clay. But you can see the turquoise paint on her body. Casting, most commonly known as the last lost wax process. And you make a clay core. And this diagram shows you, and then you model with wax, and that's where you put all the detail you want. Then you make a um, cast over that. And notice there's holes for the heat and steam to evaporate, and it's also where you pour in. You can pour in the um, bronze. So the bronze is heated and melted, poured into the cast, the clay core remains, but the wax melts. And the space between the wax is filled by the metal bronze. So that when you chip away the clay outer cover that you put over it, chip that away, and there's the head. And then of course you take off the little runnels because bronze is expensive. You would put that and remelt that down. Be smooth in shape and um, you have your cast head. So 
you lose and add. It's so it's both subtractive and additive. And here is um, the Riachi Warriors, two of the most beautiful. It's unusual to have pieces of this antiquity made from bronze because bronze was also very valuable as cannonballs. So guess what happened during wars? So a lot of ancient Greek marble statues that you see, those are copies of a bronze sculpture and it doesn't have the same tensile abilities. Look at these sculptures, they look they're freestanding. There's, you know, they they can bear weight and stand. These two warriors um, were found in the 70s. They had fallen off a ship. Apparently, they had been lashed to a ship. They believe storm brewed up. They fell off the side. They were buried in the sand. Uh, a diver was swimming off of the coast of Italy and saw this hand sticking up out of the sand. Um, quickly realized what he had found. And now we have these two beautiful sculptures and they are uh, very idealized figures. You've got the old warrior head and the beautiful male youthful body. Um, the nipples are copper, the lips are copper, ivory teeth, the, the, the eyes you can't see also have ivory in the irises. So, um, these are the were produced probably with the lost wax process and the original is destroyed in the process standard practice today is to use a different process that allows multiple castings to be made today most sculptors take their work to a specialist to be cast but at the time the riachi warriors were made 460 450 bce it was all done in the, I mean, the foundry and the casting and the putting together of these sculptures was all done in one workroom. Um, and they did not have safety equipment <laughs> the way we do today. Um, I struggled to find, there's a vase painting showing the foundry at work. And uh, it's so hot, they're basically nude as they work. I can imagine there were some horrible burns. Um, if you ever get the chance to see a, a wax a bronze casting, uh, which I have, it, it's just phenomenal. I'm going to stop here. We've gone through several terms and things. Any questions? Okay. Then so far, that can't wait till the end. Okay. Carving. It's a I much more aggressive <laughs> technique. You take that marble and you strike at it. I'm, I'm really, sorry. There is a question from oh, Kenneth oh, Williams. Yes. Can I ask you yes, that? on those two statues, uh, is that solid bronze or is there a clay core inside of it or are they hollow? There's a clay core inside of it. It, it, it is a very rough figure probably. Uh, there might be some armature, like, you know, uh, stick pieces in the arms, but no, these are, these are solid bronze. Um, they, if you get to Riachi, Italy, it has, they have their own little museum and they are breathtakingly beautiful. Um, I, uh, they're, you know, I mean, they really look like they're gonna take a breath or they're gonna move. Um, and most people who talk about these sculptures say that the fact that they were being exported out of Greece implies that they weren't of the highest caliber I don't know. I think they're pretty magnificent. Um, and it's very rare. I'm trying to think through that. The charioteer of Delphi, you may be familiar with, even he is not a complete bronze sculpture. These survived because they were lost for centuries. And, um, you know, but like I said, they are very much, a, um, you know, they're, priceless there they give us a view of what the ancient greek bronze sculptures were like um they get the bronze with marble marble so heavy you end up needing support so you'll see these odd struts sometimes it's often a way to tell if it's a marble copy of a bronze sculpture because if you marble is so heavy the sculptures will tip over 
whereas the bronze can stand on their own because they're they're mostly hollow. So there's there and, and the qualities of bronze chemically molecularly allows it to be these freestanding figures. And so, like I said, they may have had at one point spears in that uh, left hand, as you see, maybe even a shield. We know the Parthenon, the the Parthenon, the the frieze on the Parthenon was decorated that way. The figures, they don't today, but the figures originally had bronze blades for their swords, shields. Um, they were painted. Um, it, it, you know, it, the reaper, you know, you can find reproductions of what they must have looked like at the time, but it can't capture the scale the atmosphere of the Acropolis, you know, this high hill, it's the highest hill in Athens. Um, you know, yeah, I wish I had that time machine. <laughs> Any more questions? Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There may be like sticks in the limbs, but there's a probably a fairly solid core in the torso. And I think we do have oh, another question. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Our comment, uh, we remember from art class something called the Apollo Belvedere. Yes. And the pose is yes. pretty well similar in a lot of yes. statues. Yes. Well, the, the pose, and we'll talk about the contrapposto pose, was very, very prevalent in Greek art and for a reason. Um, you know, they, they admired the figure. The human figure was beautiful, particularly the male figure. So they were trying to produce idealized figures is very doubtful a male warrior with the age that you see in the faces would have the youth and the physicality of the body it's the ideal warrior the wisdom of the age you know of experience but the brawn and, and physical agility of the youth you know but if you if you get to make it up as you want it to be why not you know i mean your imagination and your talent run free so um, one of my all-time favorite sculptures, if you get to Rome, make an opportunity to go to the Borghese Gallery. You have to have an appointment. They let a certain number of people in for two hours, and then they kick you out and bring in the next group. Don't show up and expect to get a ticket. You might, but it's very rare. Book it in advance. I booked mine before I left Little Rock, so... Um, but this is Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who is a personal favorite of mine as an artist. And keep in mind, this is marble, but look how he makes it look like skin, the dimples of the fingers digging into her thigh. This is um, Hades stealing Persephone. And you know, the, the myth is he takes her to the underworld, the under um, hell texture and he she eats six um pomegranate seeds so she has to spend six months of the year with him in the underworld and she can spend six months out in the world her mother is the goddess of summer persephone is the goddess of spring so um you know he's infatuated with her beauty obviously she does not want to go it's hard to see in this particular photograph, but her left hand is pushing on his face and the skin is being pushed up. This is a magnificent, these are just slightly larger than life-size sculpture. Um, the Cardinal Borghese had the wisdom to recognize the young Bernini's talent and commissioned several uh, sculptures. So Bernini's David is there, Apollo and Daphne, and this work and uh, it's just breathtaking carving again as i said it's a more aggressive technique you know they pound and chip and gouge away but the sculptor has to study the marble because if he doesn't work with the grain it fractures and breaks away so you know this idea that the figures were inside and somehow the sculptor released them is a very common statement um, again, look at the veins on Hades' hand in the detail. Um, this is just a magnificent work. 
um, and the Baroque, which is the period of time uh, Bernini was creating his sculptures, was about drama, the most dramatic moment. And this is a very dramatic moment. He's picked her up. She doesn't want to go. She's fighting. He's holding on as tight as he can. And, um, you know, in, in seconds, they're going to move because they cannot hold on to this pose. Notice beneath um, her left foot, you see there's some kind of, well, it's actually Cerebus. It's the dog, the three-headed dog of hell. He needs that figure there. It fits the story, but it's also there to give stability to the marble. That sculpture would tip over if her foot was free standing. It does not have the, the, the ability to be a freestanding sculpture in quite the same way the Riachi warriors are. Notice there's a base supporting his feet. And um, all of that is to keep the marble upright, you know, to give it the weight at the base so it doesn't fall forward. So, but of course, Bernini is working in marble. He understands the qualities of marble. And um, I, 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 someone who can take stone and make it look like skin, you know, just takes my breath away. So, one of my favorite sculptures, as I said, if you get to Rome, the, put the Borghese Gallery on your uh, list. It has a beautiful garden surrounding it. It was a palace. And there's Titians. In, um, the Cardinal was a very astute art collector. And there's hardly anything in that palace that's not worth spending your time looking at. And I actually love it that they limit the number of people who can be in there. It's not nearly as crowded as a lot of art museums are, but it does mean you need to make sure and book a time to see it. So well worth your effort. So assembling, very much a 20th century idea. Uh, David Smith's Q by um, seven, 12, excuse me, from 1963. Um, and he took forms and grouped them together and assembled them. So they're called assemblage. And steel has great strength, and makes very possible these very dramatic angles. And he intends the work to be displayed outdoors. As a matter of fact, if you ever drive up to the Kansas City airport, you will pass several of his sculptures on the entranceway. It makes a very formal statement. And on a sunny day, they just gleam and gleam because they're very highly polished stainless steel. So any questions here? I was just, I was just wondering about, um, there's some sculptures out in West Little Rock that, uh, I, would that be the assemblage? I'm not sure which ones you're speaking of, but there, there are a lot, there's a lot of assemblage if you're thinking on the roundabout on, on uh, Rolling Road, yes, that's an assemblage. Okay. If it looks, you know, think of what it means. It means you took a piece of this and a piece of that and you put them together. You assembled them. Um, Chanel you know, Parkway has one too, I think. Does it? I, I, I probably drew by it a million times and just not paid attention. It, it's, it's unfortunate, but of course you do need to watch the road so <laughs> when you're driving. So... Uh, the human figure, very popular subject, it, and it cuts across almost every culture. Even though Islam has a prohibition against uh, living images, that's only in their religious documents. They have secular stories. Probably the most famous we know is, you know, the uh, Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, you know, those pictures, they're, they're stories, they're myths, they're, um, they're okay to have human figures in. It's only in religious art. They make an important distinction there. But the human figure has been the subject since antiquity. If you've ever seen the, the woman of Willendorf, uh, which is a crude little figure uh, of a woman, probably a fertility object, we have a desire to leave behind a record of ourselves. 
rulers from earliest times have left sculptures and records of their lives and action. But I promise you, uh, Ramsey II lived, he lived to be in his 90s, which was very old. He was a ruler during a very wealthy time in ancient Egypt. There are numerous, numerous sculptures and depictions of him. And nary one is he an old, short man with about three teeth and three hairs on his head. And that's what his mummy looks like. If you go into the Egyptian Museum and you go to the mummy section, you'll see his mummy. And he's just this little shriveled up man and maybe uh, less than five teeth and not much more hair. But boy, if you see his figures, he's strong and dynamic and, you know, and why is that? Okay, you, you don't want anyone to perceive you as weak. We know King Tut was young. Um, we know that he was in very poor health most of his life, and yet the figures and images we have of him are also, um, it's just a tradition. <clears throat> I was talking about George III last night with a friend, and that people were often shocked to see these portraits of him, and there were numerous ones, and then they'd meet him, and he was grossly overweight he wasn't very clean in his habits he looked nothing like the handsome young king in his portraits well there's a reason for that so you see these idealized manners and that's what it's called it's very it's naturalistic you recognize that it's a human figure you can tell the gender of the individual um you have a sense you know the ears the eyes everything looks looks like the world looks to you more or less and but they're young they're attractive and remember beauty changes and from culture to culture and era to era what is fascinating about this pair the queen and her husband is that she is essentially the same size as he is the egyptians were very much into hierarchy of scale that is the biggest figure monumental figure is the most important so the queen was important but she was never as important as the pharaoh so her figures would be you know maybe knee high in some of them but we also know that they had sculptures that they put into the tombs the pyramids and the, all the various uh, intricate kinds of tombs that were there in case their mummy was destroyed because they needed to keep their their physical body so that their soul in the afterlife could inhabit it but let's say something happened to your body your mummy you know um, a fire rats something um you would have a sculpture that you then your soul could take over and have a body to inhabit in the afterlife you'll see if you see the tomb goods from King Tut, there are numerous little statues that are meant to be the servants in the afterlife because, you know, King Tut doesn't want to wash his own laundry. He doesn't want to cook his own food. So he brought these mummy, these, excuse me, these sculptural figures to work as servants for him in the next life. And as I said, it crosses cultures, faiths. This is Kuya, a Buddhist monk. And he advocated constantly chanting and da dancing to ask the aid of the of Buddha. And he traveled across Japan. He, he was, you know, um, an itinerant monk. And coming, those little figures coming out of his mouth are the six syllables of the chant, Namu Amida Butsu which relatively means translation, vagaries call upon the aid of the Amada Buddha which is a specific form of the Buddha this is a wood sculpture from the Kamakura period in Japan um, wood is a relatively difficult substance to obtain in Japan so it was you know that that it was used you see the gong that he would 
you know, he would bang it as he walked through the towns and the countryside, chanting constantly this prayer calling upon Amida. And um, the artist, in a very interesting way, uh, has this little stick, and those are six Buddha figures, and they are the six syllables of the chant. Um, it's a favorite of mine. It's a very active pose, and uh, and actually Kuya, the the monk, was actually a very popular figure in uh, his time. Contrapposto. Um, ancient Greek art, again, they were fascinated with the human body and coming up with the most beautiful, most representative. It's both idealized and naturalized. You know, it looks like a natural figure. And they really considered, really the first people were to consider the human body in and of itself as a work of art. And um, the fig leaves, those were the Victorians running around putting those on. Um, again, this was probably a bronze sculpture. You see the post at the back. You can see the remnants of a, of a strut there in his right leg. Um, this was probably a marble copy of, because marble was easier to, and easier to work with in some ways, and certainly, and even probably cheaper than bronze and so um, lots of marble copies and we're grateful for them because there are many many sculptures we would not know any other way this is the struggle scraper um, it's an athlete who after he has worked out and worked up a sweat he takes this scraper thing and he scrapes the grime and the dirt and sweat oils of course because they oiled their muscles off of his body before they go into the various pools. So, you know, contrapposto is a method of portraying the human figure, especially in sculpture. So the body is relaxed and mobile, forming this S curve. You see, notice the shoulders tilt. If your right shoulder's up, your, your, uh, your hip is down and vice versa. It, this body weight is you, the weight is born upon one leg. And if we were in a classroom, I would have all of you stand, put your weight upon one leg and stand there. And you'll see it's a very relaxed pose. We often stand that way when we don't even realize it. I've caught myself standing that way, standing in line at the grocery store. It is a very natural pose. It's a pose we take but the curves it created, the tilt in the hips and the tilt in the shoulders, they found those curves very beautiful. So this is contrapposto. That's the name of the pose. Um, and if you look at the back, um, the buttocks, there's one higher than the other. If you have any doubt whether a sculpture is in standing in contrapposto, walk around to the back and you'll see the buttocks that are one is higher than the other and that is just indicative of the contrapposto stance but you should be able to tell from the front you've got a rigid knee a relaxed knee you've got the hip shift the shoulder tilt um and you know it's like i said this is supposed to be an athlete who's worked out vigorously and is now cleaning up and getting to relax. And um, you get that sense of calm even in his face. So. And this was an anonymous male. This wasn't a god. This was because the human in Greek was almost perfect. The male, that is. So the female nude was a whole nother subject. Um, the, and another thing about the third dimension, to truly appreciate freestanding sculpture, you must view it from all sides. If you do not walk around a sculpture and view it from various angles, you will not appreciate the entire beauty of the work. Um, Michelangelo's David, an image that most of us are very, very familiar with, 
he looks very different when you're looking up and from the side. Um, his face looks a little more intense, a little bit more confrontational than he does when you're looking straight on. Um, but the, an excellent example of this is Auguste Rodin's The Burgers of Calais. This was a historical event during the Hundred Years' War between England and France. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't, ex it did last a hundred years, but they had, you know, they didn't fight in the winter. They'd have their battles, they'd have sieges. They might hold your city in siege throughout the seasons, but for the most part, the actual battlefields were spring and summer, and you went home during the rest of the year. So a war could last a hundred years easily. Um, and the city of Calais was captured by the British. And so the British said, we'll, um, we'll surrender the city, but six men um, have to offer their lives. And there are six burghers, the rulers, the city council, hard to imagine our city council or any city council for this matter, offering their lives, but they were hung from the city walls because it was a walled city. Rodin um, shows each figure facing death with individual emotions. Um, I tried to capture some of those different figures to give you a sense. This is a sculpture that has multiple copies. You can see it in various places. So sometimes you'll look at photographs and they'll have more of a uh, green cast to it because of where and how it's displayed. The original one is in Calais, so if you ever get to France and get to the city of Calais, make an effort to see this. This is a monumental event, but, you know, some of the men seem resigned. Others are, you know, I can't believe this is happening to us. You know, you see the man holding his head. Um, it, each person has an individual reaction to their fate that's coming up. And as I said, you don't appreciate that. You can't see every figure if you only look at it from one angle. Walking around it gives you different views of the men. So, kinetic sculpture. It's a sculpture that moves. Alexander Calder invented works that he titled mobiles and they were abstract shapes that moved independently usually by natural forces such as air one of my favorite works by uh, calder is at the national gallery of art in washington dc it is posed at the high above a staircase and the people walking up and down it create currents of air that make it move um, it is, it's not moving because of anything the sculpture itself is doing. Installation is a very 20th century idea. And this is one that a lot of people kind of go, what uh, is this art? Um, yeah, it is. And sometimes it's very, very intriguing. Christo and Jean-Claude, very famous for their installation art. Christo died recently, you may remember this. Um, it's large scale, mixed media, it means I use different materials and it's designed for a specific place and especially with Christo and Jean-Claude for a temporary period of time. And this is the gates at Central Park. Um, he had the idea from 1979 on, but he did not install it until 2005. Um, it was in February and these bright orange gates, you know, wandered, you wandered through Central Park. Everything was made to be recyclable. Christo, if a tree was in the way, the tree got to stay there and they moved the posts. Um, they were very, very aware. They wanted the environment to be the same that it was before they left. They did not want to make a damage. The saffron uh, material went to Buddhist monks to make robes out of. And um, this was in 2005, so not that long after 9-11. And in a, a time of year that can often be very dark and dreary, these bright orange um, 
things, these gates, and it was a pathway that you could walk through, was created, and um, it was a bright note in a um, beautiful park. So, so thank you. I have really enjoyed these classes with you. I hope you all stay well and be safe. And we'll have, we're going to have all online Zoom classes in the fall, and we'll see you then. I do have a question, uh, yes. and it's from Ken Williams. He asked if you have any books recommend that you can recommend on art history or nonfiction or fiction. Um, art history, not art techniques. Okay. Art. Art. History. art. Um, if you wanted to look, a, a good basic textbook is called Living with Art. Um, numerous editions. It's the textbook used through in most universities throughout the nation uh, that where I drew most of these lectures from. And it starts out with concepts about art, talks of, then there's a section about um, techniques, much more in depth. And then they talk about the camera arts and things. And then it moves into a nice overview of art history. Of course, everybody has like, oh, they left my favorite painting out or my favorite sculpture out. But those are nice. And the good thing is there have been multiple, I think they're in the 12th, maybe 13th edition of Living With Art. So you can buy a used 9th, 10th edition for not a lot of money, under 20 bucks probably. And you still get the content. Get one that hasn't been marked up by a student. You can even, I don't you can even rent a copy from Amazon. Um, but that's a good just introductory to all these different ideas. The, the um, principles of design, the um, concepts of art. There's the, you know, there's, you know, um, symmetry and balance. And it takes you through all of these and shows you, talks about the color wheel. Those are some of the first topics. Then there's a section on what I just did. And then there's the remaining section and they have some non-Western sections in there. Good overview. I think living with art, it's not a perfect textbook, but it's a good one. Um, the art history, the big survey of Western art to keep in mind. Um, Stockstead, Jansen. Mm -hmm. I knew Marilyn Stockstead. I met Marilyn Stockstead um, at Kansas. She, um, used her textbooks primarily. So I do like the Stockstead, but Jansen, there's a lot of those out there. They're art history <laughs> will be the title. Um, those are good places to start. If there's areas you're interested in, the Oxford history of art books, you know, they take medieval, you know, um, any, any bookstore at a good art museum, and I'm talking, you know, major art museums like um, that it can have a big bookstore. The Metropolitan in New York has a fabulous bookstore, as does the National Gallery in D.C. If you ever get there, they have some good survey books. Um, I mean, you, you can get a textbook that is so focused, you know, that they're talking about the brushwork of one particular artist, if you want that detailed. But just for an overview, I'd go with Living With Art. And like I said, buy an older edition. The content's the same. What they change up are the images. And the last chapter in the book covering post-2000, that chapter changes the most because we're still sorting those artists out. We know the Monets and the Manets and, and Picasso and Matisse. But the closer to our current time we get, the harder that is to sort out. So that's where you see the most change. And it's actually kind of fun as an instructor to see who ends up in those, you know, contemporary pages. Um, and they change every time they have an edition. Any more questions? Any more I'm going to stop your uh, screen sharing for a minute so you can see everybody maybe. Yeah, um, thanks. I never can get that gallery view is what I want. And Gloria, did you have another question or something? No, I just wanted to know, I'm the one who asked the question and thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm trying I was to get curious, it I, somebody asked about fiction with fiction. art. Oh, you know, I don't read, I mean, I think art history, the real stuff is pretty interesting. 
Um, I'm trying to get to the gallery view, guys. Um, where, what am I doing wrong? Up in the other, to the top corner, you may see a speaker view where you may see nine little dots next to each other. Yeah, that, there we go, gallery view. Um, let's see. Um, the pearl earring, the girl with the pearl earring, lots of people will enjoy that. Uh, it's about Vermeer. But sometimes if it's, particularly when I was, you know, studying these classes and taking, you know, a seminar on Rembrandt, you know, to read a fictional book about Rembrandt, you're going, that's not true. That's not what really happened. Because fiction has to, has a narrative, they have a goal. Um, it's like a very famous uh, Civil War book uh, from the 70s about Gettysburg, of uh, the Avenging Angels or something by Jeff Sharara. Um, I can't get past the first chapter because he has the premise that Lee knows there's a letter going to Lincoln um, where the Confederacy will calls for a truce and they're going to let the Confederate States just stand in the United States, you know, be what was left. And, you know, that is completely historically inaccurate and and whether that letter got delivered depends on whether Lee wins the Battle of Gettysburg. And, and I just keep going, but that didn't happen. <laughs> I want to know what really happened with my history. So I'm not a good person to talk to you about fictionalized books about um, artists. I apologize. Um, there's apparently a very good one about uh, Van Gogh, Dr. Gachet. Garden or something like that. Dr. Gachet was uh, the physician that treated Van Gogh, put him in the mental institution, treated him with foxglove, which is digitalis. Um, so, you know, that very sharp chartreuse, very yellow, yellow green that seems very popular to Van Gogh. A lot of people theorize because one of the symptoms of digoxin toxicity, which is the drug we get from foxglove, is they get a yellow halo in their vision. So some of people have theorized that Van Gogh had a little too much foxglove on board and that's why that color is so vivid. I don't know, I mean, there's more stuff made up about Van, Vincent Van Gogh than you can shake a stick at. Um, he did not cut off his ear. He got at most the earlobe. Um, he did not put it in the mail to a girlfriend. I mean, I heard that one when I was just a little girl, but it's not true. Um, he did have severe uh, problems with depression, alcoholism, but as someone, a professor once pointed out to me, he produced a huge volume of work in a relatively short period of time. You cannot be psychotic and do that. You know, it takes too much focus, too much planning. Now he was broke all the time. And um, Gauguin was very, very, um, Gauguin moved in with him in Arles for a time and, and uh, used and abused poor Vincent, who was easily used and abused. But, um, but then there's the whole body of work he left. And, you know, it takes most of our breaths away, so. I don't know. Maybe thank you. you. Thank you very much, Sandra, for okay, all yeah, your we suggestions. Can <laughs> we can. Uh, I could live in the Metropolitan for at least a month oh, and still too. not see everything, I'm me sure. I, I'm, I, Tom Cruise got a personal after hours and Katie Holmes is when they were making a movie together and they started dating. They got a personal tour of the lure of after hours. And I was like, you're wasting it on Tom Cruise. Let me come, you know. Let me do that. We'll say well, something that's life. not a waste. That's yes. a good segue. Something that's not a waste is in another week and a half, our brochure will come out and you can yes. see what classes are available in the fall. And registration will open on August 10th. Uh, all of our classes will be online and there will be a fee. So we thank you for practicing during this free time and open time and uh, for all of our brave instructors who have been with us during this learning curve and all of our students who have come during this learning curve, we appreciate any you all being here very much. That, any comments about Zoom, I think would be greatly appreciated because it has been a learning experience for all of us. 
Yes, I, I think it works well for PowerPoint sometimes, depending upon what size mm -hmm. monitor you have. For some people, they get to see the screen a little better and they get to see the details and the art or maps or whatever a little bit better. Um, and so it's been it's been interesting. Uh, this morning, we had an instructor who was teaching from Lake Village, Arkansas, because she couldn't be in her office. So, you know, remote teaching, remote learning, it's happening. <laughs> and we appreciate you all being on this journey with us. I'm going to stop our class now and stop the recording on Facebook and let's all applaud Miss Sandra. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you. I applaud you. you guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll uh, see you at our next class or see you in the fall. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.